You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey Vet Rehabbers, this week it's a podcast for those interested in the equine field, but I think our small animal Vet Rehabbers would find this information useful and really interesting too. Solange McHale talks to Anae Lloyd about research looking at using shockwave therapy to treat back pain in horses. Now every month online pet health members get access to live webinars, business training and we have a whole library of recorded webinars. So as of the date of this podcast we have 42 hours of webinars in the members library for our equine Vet Rehabbers. We also do a monthly summary of a research paper. We know how important it is that we need to keep up to date with the latest research. So this was a topic for one of our research refreshes and we are giving all of you, our loyal podcast listeners, access to this research refresh. Online Pet Health members, you can head over to the members portal to access it. And if you're not a member, you can go to onlinepetal-info.com forward slash EP101. I'll repeat that, onlinepetal-info.com forward slash EP101. But first, a word from our sponsors. PulseVet are the global leaders in veterinary shockwave technology. They manufacture the Pulse and Versatron family of products. Now, for those of you that don't know how, what shockwave therapy is, it's a non-invasive, high-energy sound wave therapy that can be used on both large and small animals, mainly to treat multiple soft tissue and musculoskeletal conditions. With over 20 years of clinical research, PulseVet is used by top veterinarians and veterinary rehab therapists to improve the quality and speed of healing, to relieve pain, stimulate bone and tissue growth, and improve the mobility for their patients. For more information, you can go to PulseVet.com and you can also meet the PulseVet team at their virtual exhibit stand at the Vet Rehab Summit in November. So over to Solange and Anne. Hi Solange, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Annette. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> so Solange has just done a research refresh recording for us on extracorporeal shockwave therapy um, in horses. So Solange, will you tell us a little bit about this research paper that you covered and what our viewers can expect if they go and watch that research refresh? Uh, well, this paper, I think it has some very interesting points. First point is that the shockwave is able to provide analgesia in horses with back pain. I think that's the, the main point. But then the second point is how the, uh, uh, the shockwave can be used to provide this analgesia. Because uh, in the experiment, the thoracic area uh, responded better than the lumbar area. So for the thoracic area, maybe one session is enough in the clinical field but not for the lumbar area. Maybe for the lumbar area, you need three uh, treatments, three sessions in order to provide anesthesia for the lumbar area. So the second point of this paper is to teach us how uh, is the best way to apply the shock wave for back pain. And uh, the third thing we can get from this paper is that uh, the shock wave treatment didn't increase the size of the multifidus muscle which is a deep stabilizer for the column. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's a, a muscle that is very important. Many physical therapy uh, papers uh, wants to show that you have to strengthen this muscle in order to provide stabilization for the back. Mm -hmm. So uh, as the shock wave is not able to increase the size of the multifidus, uh, you should combine the shock wave with other techniques, exercise, uh, vibration plate in order to uh, achieve that so then you have a more complete uh, rehab protocol. Hmm. So those are some three very important points to take away from that from that paper. I, I like it. Um, so in the you, they use pressure geometry in this paper to measure um, whether the pain threshold improved or didn't improve. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what is pressure algometry? How does it work and how reliable is it for us? Uh, pressure algometry is the use of the algometer, which is this device. Uh, it records the pressure applied on the tissue. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want to, to record how much uh, pain the animal has, it, it's, it's like a number for your palpation. 
uh, when you palpate, you just make the pressure and the animal reacts. Mm -hmm. But with that, it's more objective because you get a number uh, of this pressure that mm -hmm. is being exerted. So uh, if the animal is painful, if you just press a little bit, you have a number. For example, five kilograms. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, if uh, you made uh, some uh, modality uh, for analgesia, and then you want to record uh, the effect of this modality, shock wave, for example, then you're going to make the pressure again, and then this number probably will be higher, right? Because it, it will need more pressure in order to the animal show some, some pain response. Uh, the area will be with analgesia. So then when you have a higher number, that means that uh, uh, you, you provide uh, analgesia to the area. Ah, oh, okay. And so I've wondered about pressure algometry. How practical is it for the average clinician to use it? Is it something that we could be using in our clinics to be more objective with our patients? Um, to have, you know, numbers on a piece of paper that we can show to our owners and to our vets um, when we're communicating with them that are very objective. Is it something that we can use for that purpose? Yes, I, I think it is. Uh, it's a very uh, non-expensive uh, tool. I paid like $400. And I think it's very useful to record uh, uh, for the reports of the patient. So the clinicians, uh, the owner can see that the pain really improved the pain score. Oh, I, I, very, I like it. I like it very much. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, me too. I bought because of that. Because if you want to do some uh, uh, experiment uh, mm -hmm. about pain, I think it's uh, the, the best way to do it. Dr. Kevin Hausler has a paper uh, validating the algometer, the, algome the pressure algometry. Okay. And uh, it's very interesting too. Okay, thank you. I think I might have a look at that, um, at that research paper by Dr. Hausler. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that, um, okay, so the, the shockwave therapy provided analgesia. Um, and that the analgesic effect was different between the thoracic and the lumbar area. Um, can you explain a little bit what were the findings there? Uh, in the thoracic, uh, the shock wave replied earlier, like uh, at, uh, they uh, made uh, the measurements at seven days, 14 days, every seven days. Mm -hmm. But in the thoracic, they found that seven days, uh, it was okay. So maybe one session for the thoracic, uh, it's okay to provide analgesia. But in the lumbar area, uh, it replied later, just on the th after the third session. Uh, yeah, they found an analgesia in the lumbar area. Uh, so uh, it, it replied uh, less, le uh, uh, the percentage was less of the effect, and mm -hmm. also later. Okay. And in the paper, uh, in the experiment, in the paper, they mention about the biomechanics. Uh, that's probably due to the biomechanics of the back, which mm -hmm. is different from the thorax to the lumbar area. But I think the anatomy plays also a big uh, role on that because uh, in, the, uh, in the lumbar area, especially from L2 to L5, the segment measure, uh, we have the, um, the gluteus medius muscle, which is a very big muscle layer, uh, which we don't have at the thoracic area. Mm -hmm. So this way, the shock wave will be more far away from the target area, mm -hmm. which is the facet joints, okay, than in the thoracic area. So I think uh, that's another possible reason uh, why the, the, the results were different. Okay. And, and what kind of pathologies were they, were they treating? Were the pathologies, yeah, what, what pathologies were they finding in these group of horses? Uh, in, in the thoracic, the uh, kissing spines, mm -hmm. and uh, in the lumbar, it, it, uh, the most common was the articular facets uh, osteoarthritis. Okay. Is articular facets osteoarthritis in that lumbar area um, quite common? I think that's a little bit off topic for us, but um, I've, I've often wondered how, 
how common you know arthritis in those fastened joints are especially in the lumbar area where it's more difficult for us to um to, to image and to to diagnose those pathologies yeah yeah it can be diagnosed by ultrasound mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, the lumbar area uh, probably has more osteoarthritis of the facet joints because of the biomechanics. The, the lumbar area, it's a very uh, <laughs> mobile area. <laughs> uh, so it has a lot of uh, dorsal ventral movement mm -hmm. and uh, probably that's why uh, there is more osteoarthritis. Okay. Okay, so what we can take from, from that is that it, it requires more treatments with shockwave therapy, um, you know, three treatments at least before we're seeing an analge uh, the, the required analgesic effect in that lumbar area. And maybe more than three treatments because you were saying that the analgesic effect is still less than what we were seeing in the thoracic area. Is that right? No, uh, at three, they got the uh, uh, analgesia, okay. but uh, uh, it's just uh, uh, the two regions uh, respond differently. It's okay. something to keep in mind if you want to do shockwave in the back. Yes. Okay, that sounds good. So if we then think about the cross-sectional area of the multifidus muscle and that that didn't respond in any way to the, to the shockwave therapy, um, like, what does that mean for us practically in clinic? Uh, the multifidus muscle is a, a deep uh, stabilizer of the column, and it, it's very uh, uh, important muscle. Uh, usually, when they found uh, a problem in the back, like uh, um, a problem uh, in the joint, uh, what uh, you, uh, can happen is the multifidus at the same side can be uh, with some atrophy. Mm -hmm. So it's very important in a rehab program to strengthen this muscle. So the size of the multifidus is very important. And uh, the paper from Narelli Stubbs uh, showed that exercises, for example, can increase the size of the multifidus. So maybe it's a very important thing, you not only uh, look at the analgesia in the area, but also mm -hmm. to strengthen the, the muscle in, in a problem area mm -hmm. to, for a complete rehab protocol. Yeah, okay. So, so really highlighting that we need to have um, not only a multimodal approach, but not only one goal. So it doesn't help to just um, take the pain away if we're not... Um, strengthening and, and rehabilitating the movement of that animal, then it could very well, you know, the pain could very well recur because um, the spine doesn't have that strength and stabilization to maintain the correct biomechanics, the correct posture, and then we'll have a recurrence of, of, of injury or worsening of the pathology. Am I understanding right? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, great. So, um, what were my other questions that I had? What were the dosages that they were using with this um, shockwave therapy? How were they applying it? Uh, they apply it uh, parallel to the midline, just on the side of the midline, and angle 45 degrees to mm -hmm. reach the epidus muscle area. Okay. Um, and, and like how long did that treatment take? Uh, actually, it takes, uh, when you set up the machine of mm -hmm. uh, the shockwave, like uh, probably they set up for 750 pulses for mm -hmm. each side, mm -hmm. because it was the total of uh, 1,500 pulses. So uh, 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 when you set up the machine, you just uh, go uh, until the pulses uh, end, then the machine is stopped. Okay. Uh, the shockwave is a pretty fast treatment. Okay. So, okay, on, great. On the frequency you set up in the machine, in a couple of minutes, you finish. Finished, right. Are the, were the horses, um, did they, were they anesthetized for the treatment or sedated for the treatment? Mixing my dogs and horses. I, I just don't remember, but I, I, uh, I, I don't really remember okay. this uh, but I think uh, it, it's not necessary. Usually okay. when I do shock, I don't sedate. 
Okay, right. Yeah, like I say, I'm mixing the, the dogs and the horses in my mind now um, with the shockwave treatments. <laughs> right. No, no, no. Uh, for horses, uh, uh, it's very rare to, to sedate it. Like, uh, especially for the back, I think it's something very easy. Okay, that's, that's good to know. So an easy modality to use and to incorporate into your treatment program. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, was there anything else, Solange, that was important for you for us to discuss um, and to share with our listeners on this paper? I think a, a very important message is to, uh, to look uh, at all the needs of the patient. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, uh, in this case, not only the pain, but also uh, to strengthen the, the area. Uh, that gives us the sensation that we, we, we need to include exercises in our protocols in order to make a, a rehab program. Uh, I think uh, uh, this paper so, shows that. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Solange, for, for sharing that knowledge with us and for doing this research review um, and for answering my questions. I really appreciate it. Have a wonderful day. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about veterinary rehabilitation. For more information about continuing education for vet rehab therapists that you can do online, you can go to onlinepetal.com. I'd like to thank you for listening to this podcast and of course thank our sponsors Pulse Vet. We thank them for their commitment to their mission to improve the quality of life of the animals animals that we all love by developing, validating and providing advanced shockwave therapy at the highest level of support and service. Remember you can reach them at pulsevet.com or info at pulsevet.com. See you all next week.